Hello and welcome to Hacking the Exile, the shows that give you all the extra material you need to really appreciate the Exile 6 e webisode. Today I'm once again guested by the star of the show, Amelia Andersdotter. Welcome. Thank you. I'm, I'm as always pleased to have you here. Today we're going to start with something light and, and you know, uh, easy to grasp, uh, child sexual abuse material. Yeah, that's a controversial topic. Uh, but just to be clear, we dislike this, right? Um, we dislike this. Is there anyone who don't dislike it? I don't think that there's anyone in the world who likes the thought of children getting sexually abused. No. So by stating that you're fighting against this kind of material, you're sort of on a solid ground. Um, I would assume so, yes. You would have a large political backing for that. Basically, no one would say, well, that's a weird idea. Why would you want to do that? Um, so, technically, there has been research which shows... No, can I actually say that? It's not so good. If you say that you oppose this kind of content, you're sort of on a solid ground. Yeah. Uh, which gives you an opportunity to perhaps present not always the best solutions. That is a safe statement, Which yes. brings us to the digital arena, where you usually use this kind of argumentation for... Um, well, so child sexual abuse material has been brought up consistently uh, around like internet topics for the past, what, 20, 25 years or so. Um, normally the method adopted by politicians when trying to get, get rid of child sexual abuse material on the internet is some type of blocking or filtering strategy, which has been very controversial since um, the blocking and filtering methods applied have often been intransparent and incomprehensible to um, users and therefore have posed a risk to things like freedom of expression. By accidentally or not so accidentally blocking other materials as well. Yeah. Uh, so uh, then the politicians have seen this, they have learned and they've stopped uh, trying to do this. Actually, it's very cheap to block or filter the internet, or like it's a relatively che cheap measure for a politician to propose. It doesn't um, cost the state anything. It's it doesn't cost the government mm. anything. Any systems would have to be implemented by um, the private sector or often the internet service providers. So this is a proposal that comes back um, again and again, even though it's been criticized since its very conception. Um, and the private sector will comply because they don't want to be seen as harboring uh, child sexual abuse material. It is indeed very difficult as a private company to be faced with the accusation that you are somehow endorsing children getting sexually abused. Even if you're only trying to preserve freedom of speech? Even if you're only trying to preserve freedom of speech. So the argument that would be used against that is of course that a child sexual abuse image uh, doesn't constitute freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. um, but so one of the arguments that is often lost when it comes to child sexual abuse material is how, how do we help children who get sexually abused? Because if we um, assume that, it, that we don't like the idea of people producing child sexual abuse material, that we don't like children getting sexually abused, we would optimally want to have effective strategies in society for um, punishing people who sexually abuse children and maybe also having punishment of people who... And finding them. And finding the people who <laughs> sexually abuse children, finding the people who distribute child sexual abuse material. Which would also actually be more difficult if it's blocked. That would be more difficult if it's blocked. Typically, if material gets blocked on the internet, it can very easily crop up on, on some, in some other location. Let's say on some other server, somewhere else in the world. Um, it can spread very easily. Um, so, but yeah. basically, they're targeting the wrong part of the value chain. Yeah. But when, but when you tell politicians this, other politicians, they will, they will stand silent a moment and they will say, oh yeah, you're right, I will stop pushing for this agenda anymore. Well, so I think the problem is um, you have some consortia in Europe that work a lot with producing internet filtering lists. Some of them are very resourceful and they're a very strong kind of um, lobby and for that reason it's easy for them to reach out to many individual members of parliament or members of the European Parliament. So there's actually a very strong lobby advocating for this very ineffective measure 
that is also kind of taking grounds from uh, strategies that maybe technically would be more efficient. So, um, in the in the European landscape, actually, the best example is is um, um, Germany of and how the mature how the debate around how to deal with child sexual abuse material on the internet matured in Germany over some years they had a very fierce debate with digital freedom activists about what is the like appropriate way of dealing with the occurrences of of such images on the internet and what they realized eventually was actually you need to trace the material back to its source rather than just block it from um, all of the end users um, that requires the police to invest more resource, resources in tracking the material down to the server. Uh, but on the other hand, hopefully you will get some clue on who uploaded it, um, who is renting the server space, um, how can we find the individual who is responsible for these images being in circulation, as it were. And so the German system is now, I guess, in place for two or three years. And... Um, as far as I understand, it's been like it's been working fine. They've been able to trace. So we materials. actually have a case where where another method is more uh, successful. Yeah, and the problem is, of course, if you find the material on foreign servers in in a different like jurisdiction, then you need to have some type of police cooperation agreements in effect. But because the German system is essentially not very common in the world, we maybe don't have the right cooperation agreements between all police authorities in order to be able to effectively trace down people who harm children. Um, but that is a problem also of political will. And so uh, allocating more resources to the police for is... For this specific purpose. For this specific purpose, I guess, would be a difficult and somehow costly choice, whereas putting up a filtering list or maintaining a filtering list that you already have um, is the cheaper option. A cheap way to showing that you do something. Yeah. But uh, there's, uh, you sent two of your interns... Uh, we will see that in one of the webisodes, uh, to uh, a conference about a new way of filtering. Well, so now there are some private sector companies that are developing technologies for regulating content on the Internet. And so one way in which you can do that is identifying content at the moment it is uploaded. And then if you find that the content that was uploaded was undesirable, you block it from being uploaded onto some platform on the Internet. And so... This event was a written declaration proposed by a colleague of mine that advocates um, European, European wide um, but industry self regulated installations of upload filters. And so, upload filters that are run by the public sector or by the private sector could be very, very detrimental to a lot of kind of legal freedoms and free, like freedom of speech, freedom of expression. Um, what, like, the, the, of course, what we do with almost anything else, like. Um, also, because then you're kind of stopped before you're even able to communicate. Um, so that would be a very distressing but they're development. But they stopping a very specific type of unwanted communication. So if you have an industry self-regulated system um, where you have no judicial oversight and where the government doesn't like get involved with how it's implemented at all. Actually, what private companies most like is legal certainty. So there's going to be some cases where you have legal uncertainty. Um, and in those cases, the freedom, the freedom of speech, even if it had been valid, will probably be lost. Okay, to, to, to get it clear, you're basically saying that companies, to be on the safe side, will block rather too much than too little. Yes. And, of course, that's not a big problem for them, but it's uh, a problem for the people that are actually getting censored. Yeah, that could okay. be a problem for um, um, people. But uh, this hasn't really kicked in yet. This was a written declaration which is supposed to support uh, development in this regard. I mean, regard. not entirely. Cecilia Malmström, the Swedish Commissioner for Home Affairs in the European Union, has added to the European Union cybersecurity strategy um, one initiative called the Global Alliance for uh, Child Protection on the Internet. And in that Global Alliance steering document, there is actually references to upload filters also. And so we asked within questions to the commissioner about why they felt that upload filters would be a good idea. And they said, well, they will not propose any legislation, so it's a self-regulation initiative. Um, they don't believe that it will be particularly effective for anything, or at least they haven't bothered investigating that. 
they're not collecting like statistics to show that that this would be a good measure to undertake for the purpose of protecting actual children. Um, they're just kind of um, assuming that it's better to act in some way rather than having statistical data to show that the act actions you're undertaking are proportionate and efficient. Um, so. But no legislation. It means basically that a commission will say, we will not force you to censor, but we would be quite happy if you happen to do it. Yes. Which but means so that the they cannot is... be held responsible for any, any censoring that accidentally happens. Well, actually, so this is not what the commission said when they evaluated child sexual abuse filters in the first case before the directive on... Um, protection of children against sexual abuses in the European Union or something like this. It, it was passed by the Parliament um, without filtering mechanisms, I should ask, I should add, in 2010 or 2011. But so the impact assessment to that regulation says that um, industry self-regulation on information um, kind of blockage or filtering could end up violating fundamental human rights in the European Union if you don't have proper judicial oversight. Mm -hmm. But so if it's a self-regulatory mechanism, then of course there is no judicial oversight because you've disconnected the regulatory system from the state or the government where the judicial oversight exists. Yeah. So it would seem to me that if Cecilia Malmström had read the impact assessment of her own proposals, she would know that maybe what she is proposing for the European Union to introduce as a general cybersecurity measure in this case, um, might actually end up harming a lot the fundamental freedoms of European citizens um, that the cybersecurity strategy avows to uphold, while at the same time she manages to help no children whatsoever. Well, it doesn't seem like the best strategy, if I, if I may be a bit frank. I mean, someone should sit down with her and say, well, you know, maybe you should look at this. So. I think a lot of people have tried to sit down with her, but ultimately it's also a matter of political strength. So if you have not the adequate political strength to um, make a good strategy and perform proper impact assessments and um, weigh different interests in society against one another, then of course you're likely to land in a bad place. And so it seems to me that's what she's done. But she can still change her mind, and um, as a European citizen, of course, I'm looking forward to her doing that. So to sum it up, if you happen to run into Cecilia Malmström, feel free to have a chat with her about why uh, filter and uh, censoring online is not the best strategy. Uh, to help the children. To help the, the children. Okay, move on to other uh, less depressing topics. I haven't seen you that much lately. I mean, normally you're here all the time, which we enjoy in the office, but recently <coughs> you've been away a bit. Uh, I've been traveling quite a bit, and I will probably travel quite a bit also in May. But in April, I've been jo jojoing back and forth between different places in. Now, of course, I know every, way, every one of your travels because I, I help you with uh, flight details, but I, I'm not always uh, certain what you're doing when you're there. Oxford, for example, yeah. what happened? Why were you there? Well, I was there at the conference, and so I arrived in Oxford after going on, like, so first you go okay, on... Okay, so what, what is the conference? Then it's rigor and openness, so it's about open access mm -hmm. in scientific publications and different methods that scientists can approach open access and how they can contribute to open access, um, basically like self-help methods for scientists that want better access to other scientific publications. And so there were some publishers, there were some researchers, um, mostly natural scientific researchers because it was organized by the Clarendon Laboratory in Oxford, which is for physics, uh, but also some chemists and um, some social scientists and um, computer scientists. Um, so, I mean, I was, um, I was invited there to sit in a, in a debate in the evening about whether or not we're going through a copyright evolution or revolution and what do we need in terms of open access um, for scientific publications. But then also I decided that I would stick around for like the next day of the conference and I sat through some of the talks also on the Thursday because I thought it could be an interesting um, space to be at. It sounds like a very academic uh, conference. It was a very academic conference, With yeah. very academic people doing yeah. academic talks. 
Yes. Which, uh, of course, always is enjoyable. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit envious that I couldn't be there. Uh, and you're also going to uh, um, to London tomorrow. Yeah. Well, which would, when you see this, was you know last week or something. Yeah. yeah so tomorrow I'm at the um, the LSE which is like London School of Economics for a copyright debate. So in the UK right now, they have a lot of debates about how, how to really deal with kind of um, the copyright system and with open data. And so they have some legacy systems with the crown copyright, which is basically the copyright they apply to the public sector um, that has proven to create quite a lot of problems for open data and open government projects in the UK. Um, but so now they're looking into changing that and also they've had some problems with very, very strict interpretations of the um, uh, copyright, copyright, like users' rights in the copyright. So exceptions and limitations for the benefit of, of end users to freely use materials. So, um, and because their courts have been interpreting the users' freedoms so narrowly, um, it's looking very likely that the vast majority of the British web uh, causes users to infringe on copyright only by kind of using the web. Okay, I'm, I'm looking really forward to hearing more of this. I'm pretty sure I will hear it uh, in the car on, on Friday when we're going to Germany. Yep. Uh, we're going to the General Assembly of the German Pirates. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time today to talk about that, but perhaps you will hear us talk more about uh, our exp experience in Bavaria in a future episode of Hacking the Exile. Uh, but now we will have to end for today. Thank you very much for coming. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. And uh, see you all again in two weeks. Thank you.